So what I brought to you today is four technical value drivers of an open data lake house. And before I begin, I just want to get a show of hands. How many people here have seen an iceberg presentation in the last little bit? So you're all somewhat familiar with what iceberg is bringing to the table. But for anyone who doesn't know, I'll just go very quickly into this architecture. We're going to cover it in a little more detail in the session that follows mine. But basically what Iceberg is doing that's fundamentally different from what we've seen in other table formats is it's bringing the metadata into the file system and out of the catalog. So the catalog now just contains a pointer to the current metadata file. The metadata files themselves store the, the core table metadata and snapshot information. And then it goes into a number of manifest lists and manifest files that essentially allow us to basically break it up and make it easier to get at when we're trying to do very you know, large scale, massive parallel access to all of the data files. But the data files at the end of the day are the same data files you're already used to using, whether they be Parquet, ORC, or Avro files. So it's not a new file format. It's the files you're used to using. It's just a new way of being able to get at them quickly, retrieve the data, manipulate the data, and use the data stored therein. And Iceberg, because of this new way of handling metadata, it gives us a few new superpowers. It has acid transaction support. It has time travel and the ability to roll tables back to a previous point in time. It has in-place table evolution. You can very quickly and easily add or delete columns from the table schema itself without having to rewrite all of those files that exist. You can do better table maintenance on it to keep those tables lean and healthy. We can do better streaming and batch ingest because it is more responsive to being able to handle the kinds of things that would have impacted something like the Hive table format with the small files problem. We'll talk about iceberg replication in the session that follows, but we also have the ability to use Atlas and Ranger integration with iceberg, giving us very good ease of adoption. I'll explain a little bit how if you've already got Hive tables, how you can easily move those into iceberg. And it works everywhere where your clouds are and on premises and is highly performant and scalable. So it's ready to tackle the new larger data sets that we're finding in our environment. And how many people here are using Hive and Hive Acid tables today? So here's just a quick comparison between what Iceberg can bring to the table versus Hive Acid. And the big thing that we're dealing with, while both have Acid transactions, we both give us that kind of um, uh, stability there. We also have efficient updates and deletes on the tables. You don't get that in Hive Acid. So we can change the data in the tables, insert, update, delete, without having to rewrite or be blocked in the case of Hive Acid. Partition evolution. So this allows us to even change the partitioning scheme on the fly. And all new data will be written into new files with a new partitioning scheme while still retaining the old one using hidden partitioning. So basically, you just access the table and we'll take care of that partitioning for you. Schema evolution, we already talked about. Snapshot and snapshot isolation. Everything gets snapshotted as you use the table. So you don't have to decide when to make special copies of the table, when to use those special copies of the table, which gives us the ability to literally go back to any point in time and run a query as at a given timestamp or a given explicit snapshot ID if you happen to know them. You don't have to, you can just say as of a given timestamp and faithfully recreate the data from that point in time because you're basically looking at the data that exactly was at that point in time, regardless of what has changed. With this new me mechanism, we get much better query performance and we get cloud storage support. And of course, my favorite topic since we're here at Community Overcode, community support. Hive Acid was, was built by Cloudera at Cloudera, whereas Iceberg is contributed to by Cloudera as well as Apple, Dremio, Alibaba, Tencent, LinkedIn, Netflix, and many, many more. And that creates a greater degree of, of opportunity for innovation, broader community support, and of course, broader portability. If everyone's working with Iceberg, then Iceberg works everywhere. That also goes for Compute Engine, Spark, Presto, Flink, Dremio, Hive, Impala, NiFi, and more are all supporting the Iceberg format for read and write whereas Hive Acid has limited in Hive and Presto with read-only support with Impala, Spark, through the Hive Warehouse Connector and other things, or the, uh, the, yeah, the, the Warehouse Connector and other things. So back to this chart again, what we're seeing with Iceberg is an ability to reduce the, metal, uh, the meta store bottleneck, 
That's where we're getting our performance gains from. We get increased flexibility by being able to keep up with changes in schema, changes in partitioning methods, having those snapshots, giving us the ability to look at different data points in time, all without having to do anything special in our code and in our, and in our data definitions. Significantly reduce the impact of the small files problem. You'll notice I say reduce, we don't remove, and compaction is still something we can do, but compaction can be done more efficiently with Iceberg. And reduce the impact of data and metadata changes overall. So, great, some pretty cool technical stuff, right? And, and, and some of you folks have probably seen an even deeper dive into what's going on and all of that metadata layer and how that really makes things more effective. But I wanna take it up a level and say, so who cares? What does this really give us? Bigger, better, faster, more is only interesting if it pays us dividends. And so we find four key areas where the iceberg capability and thinking about how that applies to an open lake house architecture give us data engineering productivity, performance at scale, multifunction analytics, and essentially leading to storage deduplication and time travel. So how many people here have heard of lake house as an architecture pattern? And what's really cool about Lakehouse is this evolution of data lake and data warehouse kind of combining together to provide a single environment where all of our unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data, all of our raw and curated data can cohabitate, it means that we can do different things on the same data, in the same place, with the same security. This is great. But the first place where we see the big uh, opportunity is in data engineering productivity, building those data engineering pipelines, so the data engineer wants to build clean and curate data pipelines coming from those operational systems. And so the first thing we're gonna do is ingest new data. We're then gonna identify any of the changes between the new data and the existing data. And this is all about change data capture. So of course, we don't want to always just re-ingest from the source. We just wanna capture the changes and implement those changes in the, in the destination so our warehouses and our data lakes are as up-to-date as they can be without a tremendous uplift. But it's, it's tricky business to get right. So we identify the delta, we apply the updates, then we take backups and revert if there's any issues found. This is our typical, typical life cycle. Now what we're finding is that there's, there's a few landmines in the way. So when we're ingesting new data, the refresh frequency and the number of sources are exploding, making it very complex to get all of that data ingested properly. And then we're identifying the delta and applying the updates, having a tunable update strategy so that we can constantly keep up with these changes is also a challenge. And when we're taking the backups, that backup size is exploding, thus impacting performance. And ultimately, if we do get issues, we have to do complex tasks and manual tasks to roll back. So the power of Iceberg means first, ingesting new data, we can now move to the petabyte scale and with partition evolution, keep track of how that data is changing and how we wanna change our way of storing that. So by being able to change the partitioning from let's say by, by month to by day, or by year to by month, or any, what, any changes we wanna make to keep up with those performance and growing data sets, Iceberg is right there to take care of that, that first landmine. Now in, between identifying the delta and applying the updates, first we have asset transaction support, that's native to Iceberg. Updates, deletes, and compaction allow us to be able to bring those changes in the most efficient way. Between applying updates and taking backups, we have snapshots and the ability to exp expire those snapshots, but snapshots are basically like an automatic backup. So we don't have to maintain separate systems and separate processes to keep that past state so that when we apply the updates from the change data capture and check if there's issues, if we encounter those issues, we simply roll back with time travel. We don't have to do any additional computation, calculation, or mechanisms to get us back to our previous state. So Iceberg completely streamlines the change data capture lifecycle for data engineering, dramatically in increasing our productivity. So this is one place where we're seeing folks who are using NiFi, Flink, Impala, Spark, Hive, and many other engines being able to use this entire lifecycle in a more efficient way with everyone speaking Iceberg and taking advantage of those new capabilities. But the other is we said Iceberg gets us there faster. So by having the metadata about the files next to the files itself, instead of in a central metastore, the metastore itself is no longer a bottleneck. We get tremendous performance improvement out of that. We also can reduce the amount of data that needs to be queried and reduce the complexity of our queries on top of the data, taking advantage of some of the iceberg superpowers. So being able to take advantage of snapshots, materialize views to improve response time, 
And with engine and file format agnostics, we don't need any connectors, we don't need to change and transform the data, we don't need to do copies. Remember, I said at the end of the day, we're still on our standard table formats. So with this, we had one of our larger customers do a, a, a set of benchmarks. They analyzed 1 billion to 10 billion records and ran over 40 different complex SQL statements taken from the TPCDS benchmark and some of their own queries from their own applications. And these times are amazing. You know, 1.7 billion row count, they're getting two second response time. And then as you see it increases, okay, we see a little bit of time coming up. At that 10 billion, we see that jump to nine. Well, they're doing updates, deletes, and data skew, impacting the SQL performance, but after they did table maintenance, they got that back down to 2.5. So this is amazing, right? Being able to get 2.5 se uh, second response time over 10 billion records with complex SQL statements. This is the kind of scale and performance that we're looking to get to, and we're, we're hitting limits with our current table formats today. But now let's take a moment to think back to the idea that this is about an open data lake house. So the first two examples we, we got are really just very focused. How do I do better data engineering? How do I do better, let's say, uh, BI an, uh, analytics? But we really want to talk about the entire data life cycle because Iceberg is there to support data flow and streaming. It is there to support stream processing. It is there to support data engineering, data warehousing, machine learning. We have Spark, we have Impala, we have Hive, we have Trino, we have Flink, we have Kafka, we have all these things, uh, NiFi, all working with Iceberg. And when everybody speaks Iceberg, it all works together and we don't have to worry about changing and handing off different file formats, building connectors between systems, going from engine to engine. So with all data engine in, engines integrated with Iceberg, they can read and write the same tables. It simplifies real-time access, artificial intelligence, and streaming use cases. And here's a, one of the examples that, that, that we've been seeing a lot of folks starting to adopt. Let's say we have an on-premises traditional relational database and we want to offload some of that data into the public cloud. By using Iceberg, the data engineering writes directly into the Iceberg table formats. Data warehousing is then doing the analytics on those Iceberg formats at that better performance in the cloud. And we can then add additional secondary use cases such as machine learning model training. And again, we don't have to move the data, transfer the data, translate it, and configure it in a different format. Iceberg is there to give us that single common standard to work with for all these different use cases. And again, because of the way it's built, it is immediately compatible at performance and scale for all these different use cases without modification. And we can also take cloud-based relational databases. We see a lot of these growing where data is locked in proprietary stores. But even these engines, we're talking engines like we see with Databricks and Snowflake and, and many others are using Iceberg as an alternate table format that you can read and write and are getting closer and closer integrated into those environments. So here, you leave that same SQL engine to create the, uh, the, the, the dashboards and reports, Power BI, Tableau, Click, whatever you're using there. No disruption to the end user, no disruption to the business unit, but instead of keeping that data in a proprietary store, that all moves out to Iceberg. There, we can use Open Data Lakehouse philosophy to do data flow and streaming into the same environment. So now you can bring streaming data to those dashboards and reports. You can do data engineering and do beta, better data preparation and bring in more richer, even convert from unstructured and semi-structured to structured data that can be included in those business dashboards and reports. And you can also do secondary use cases on this data more easily, especially if they're all co-located in the same S3 bucket environment where you can then pop on machine learning and just go after the data where it lies instead of have to carve up a certain subset of the data and move it off to a corner of the business and have it run in isolation where it's not being trained on all the data and not being trained on all possible data because you didn't even know it was there. So by unlocking traditional relational data into Iceberg, we can expand the use cases and also continue to add additional ways of bringing new data into the business all without disrupting what the business is using as their front end tools. And finally, time travel. We'll talk a little bit more about time travel in the session that follows mine as well. But fundamentally, what time travel gives us is the ability to do things like audit data changes. So we can take a look at the data we have right now and compare it in another query to the data as of, let's say, yesterday. Anything that's changed is the latest data that's been loaded into the warehouse or the latest data that's been changed by our business applications or whatever it is we're looking to see where things might have gone wrong. 
or where things might have changed in a good or bad way. So this allows us to immediately keep track of the history of all operations and allows us to respond to audit requests in a more efficient way without having to build in extra process in our business logic or extra uh, schema changes in our, in our database. We also get data reproducibility. This is really interesting, especially in regula regulated industries where we need to be able to faithfully recreate reports that happen back in time. And this isn't just about getting the data from a certain time frame, because if data has been rewritten within that time frame at a future point in time from when that report was written, you're not going to get consistent results. And inconsistent results leads to business confusion and perhaps even failure to meet regulatory compliance. With these snapshots available in time travel, if I run the query as of a timestamp, and I rerun that query even six months from now with the same timestamp, I get exactly the same result back because of the power of time travel. And if we are using this as a way of improving our data quality through all of our, our batch loads or other operations, if we do an, a data audit and we recognize that certain data loads were incorrect or certain data had now become corrupt in some way or damaged, wasn't, wasn't modified in the right way, we can find the last best good known data set through the snapshots just by querying for different uh, timestamps and say, if that's the last best known good data, let's revert to that using rollback and then reattempt our loads, reattempt our, our, uh, our updates. And so this is a way of keeping the data quality, keeping the data healthy. And how many people have seen schemes that look a bit like this, where you're creating copies of tables for a given point in time, like this is the last month's uh, aggregate, this is next month's aggregate, and then you have to write these queries that call those specific versions of those tables, where a timestamp is within a certain date, and you know is current, is false, you're adding your own additional metadata to these tables to keep track of your own audit trail. So many people are doing that. You don't have to do that anymore. And so this means that even your business applications can be written in a more simplified way, less error, less opportunity for human error, less opportunity for, for systems to break down, creating inconsistencies. So you can simplify the schemas you build and the business applications you build simply because Iceberg is the table format behind. And one more bonus. This is number five. I said I promised four, but this is a bonus one. Uh, how many people here are working with or exploring DBT? So if you're using DBT, DBT provides data transformation type code, and it does it in a consistent way with the ability to add adapters in and out of the DBT environment. We have DBT adapters supporting Spark and Paula and Hive, but the way DBT works is it sends a request to the adapter, and the adapter translates that into SQL that can be run, DDL, DML, or SQL that can be run in the environment, but because Iceberg has more capability insert update delete, schema and, and partition evolution and more, we can use more of the DBT capability when our end table format is going to be Iceberg, even if we're using the same engines such as Impala, Hive, and Spark. So these are great reasons why organizations are looking at Iceberg as a way to unlock the business value from this new technology. And how many people said they had Hive tables today? So there's two great ways to get started on Iceberg. And, and, and same sort of answer. Have you started moving some of those into Iceberg yet? Well, let me show you two really cool ways. The first way is to simply use the alter table method. We basically tell the table to change its metadata management format by saying you are now an Iceberg table. What this does is essentially creates the metadata files that take care of the Iceberg stuff. But remember, this is the metadata over your existing files, so your ORC, your Parquet, your Avro files remain unchanged. We then, in the Hive Metastore in this case, or whatever Metastore you're using, in the Hive Metastore we then say, okay, instead of having the Hive Metastore keep track of all of the files as it was before, it's now keeping track of the metadata file for Iceberg, and now that takes care of the metadata situation, and it removes any references from the Hive Metastore of the uh, old table. So you're not duplicating your storage by doing this, you're basically doing a convert in place. But if you're a little worried about having that and you want to keep the old table and the new table side by side, you can also use the create table as select method. What this will do is it will still also build all the appropriate metadata, but it will then create new ORC, Parquet, Avro, your choice files to be the files for the iceberg table. Likely you'll need to give it its own unique name in the same environment and it will leave the original one completely untouched and intact. And then, 
now that we have these organizations investing in their uh, in iceberg for their business applications, the next thing we're going to want to talk to you about is things like having it available for disaster recovery, because now we're getting into the enterprise level. And for that, I've actually asked uh, Rahul to help us figure out how we're going to do that. He'll be the next talk. So this is the end of, of my talk, and I'd now like to see if anybody has any questions for me.